So Alison already provided a bit of an introduction, and of course this information is, is new to those of you in the room. Um, international, regional, and national organizations, particularly governments, have developed food composition databases or tables to provide information about the nutritional composition of foods relevant to a specific country or region. And Alison has already emphasized you know, the fundamental importance of that information. Internationally, the leader is FAO Inputs and its 18 regional and sub-regional data centers to certainly facilitate the, the, um, the sharing of, of data for composition databases and tables, but also the organization and capacity for building to improve these um, essential resources. Most food composition databases and tables are, are in the public domain, however, there are some subscription databases as well, and a couple of so in this presentation, what I'm going to talk to you about, um, one is an information resource and the second is an actual database. So first, the informational resource, this is, this is a new and very preliminary effort, if you will, by the OC Research Foundation called the World Nutrient Databases for Dietary Studies. And this is an online resource of information about country, regional, and international food composition databases and tables. And the idea is it serves the aid users in their initial assessment, and I want to emphasize initial assessment, of the scope and depth of nutritional composition data available for certain countries and regions. So in its current iteration, um, the WINS um, addresses or includes information about 90 food composition databases and tables covering 92 country, countries and 24 food classifications. So what is WINS? It is an informational resource. Think of it as a catalog or a library. It allows for the assessment of available food composition data across national, regional, and international databases and tables. And so you can query this resource for specific indicators, including descriptive information, food classifications and groups, and nutrients. And it presents findings in multiple formats, not as many formats as we would like, the reason for that is that the software platform that we're using called StatPlan, it was very inexpensive because we had very little resources to actually do this work. So there are some definite some limitations in how we're able to display the findings of any queries. What WINS is not, it is not a database, it's an informational resource. It doesn't contain compositional data from databases or tables. It provides a conduit through that information. And it doesn't provide any in-depth analyses of existing data because some of the indicators, for example, in this resource are binary. Is information present? Yes or no. <coughs> so how was WINS developed? Um, the OC Research Foundation staff put the resource together, compiled information about food composition databases, pulling that information from publicly available resources where they were able to, they reached out to food composition database managers to ask them to help confirm the information that would be included or to provide additional or new information. And then this was translated using the stat plan software into a user-friendly interface. Interface It's gone through two rounds of beta testing and we're still in a soft launch, launch, launch phase, if you will. And what we're really hoping to be able to do by, by providing you some information about this is generate opportunities for new partnerships, partnerships or contributors to, to help with this resource. A user's guide is available um, on the website um, to help users of the resource navigate through it. So if, if you were, um, if you're interested in WINS, uh, the URL where you can access this um, is up on the screen. And on the landing page, this is what you would actually see. So the, the map, um, this is the stat plan software. The countries that are highlighted in blue are those countries where there's information in the, in the resource about food composition databases or tables. One of the limitations, I mentioned already that we have limitations with the software, and one of its limitations is it's not able to actually identify multiple com countries, for example, that might be um, included in a regional database or an international database. So based on feedback from some of the people that we spoke to about the resource and tested it with, 
Um, we ended up on the side panel on the landing page um, having um, direct links through to those international and regional databases because we're just simply not able to, to um, visualize them using the global map that the current software that we have. So how could you actually use, use this resource? So here's an example. We have a graduate student who's looking for existing national level food composition data for animal source proteins, specifically meat, and micronutrients, specifically iron in Sub-Saharan Africa. So she goes to the home page and she goes uh, over to, over here we have a drop down box and she selects all regions and goes down and selects Sub-Saharan Africa. What she then recovers is a zoom in on the map of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where WINS currently has information about databases or tables. Um, and then, for example, in, in this specific case, she's particularly inter interested in Zambia. So she mouses over Zambia, um, puts her mouse on that, it turns green so she knows she's in the right country, and then a light box pops up with this descriptive information. And this is an example where we don't have complete information. This is just what we were able to access. So next, because she's interested in meats, she goes up to food classifications. Again, there's a drop down box there. She selects meats and other animal products. Then what comes up is again a visualization on the map of the countries um, included in this resource. And the gradation in color um, is indicative of, 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 of the number of entries in the database or table under that category. And again, what she's able to do, she's, in this case, she mouses over Congo, it lights up in a different color, and then she sees this is one of those binary indicators I mentioned. Binary indicators I mentioned um, before, so she can see that yes, um, information is present in the database. In, in this case, sorry, it's not binary, it's the actual number. So then, because she's interested in iron as well, she moves over to nutrient information. Um, there's a drop down box again, she selects iron. Again, we have the visualization of the informational resources in WINS in Sub Saharan Africa. And this is an example of where the information is binary, so iron is included. In this case, she's particularly interested in Tanzania. And so the information comes up about Tanzania. And then if she double clicks on Tanzania, it takes her directly to the food composition tables. So that's just a very brief overview um, of this informational resource. As I mentioned already, it, it's definitely um, a work in progress. And so what we'd like to be able to do is continue to improve the user interface. Um, we'd like to be able to commit to updating the resource with, with new information um, twice a year. But most importantly, this is a work in progress, and so we, we haven't had a formal launch of WINS at all yet. And so what we're really hoping for is, is, is feedback, but particularly partnerships, where we're able to improve this resource. So the second um, ILSI Research Foundation effort that I want to, to talk to you about, this is an actual database, the ILSI Crop Composition Database. And I'm not sure, sure how many of you might actually be familiar with this. It provides analytical data about the natural variability in the composition of crops, looking at nutrients and anti-nutrients, um, of conventional crop varieties. And these data have multiple uses in the assessment of natural variation. Um, they could be used in nutritional studies, and also can be used by plant breeders, for example, who are particularly interested in modifying the nutritional content of the crop species that they're working on. So we can actually use the resource to find out what is the crude variability. So just to, to give you a little bit of background on the genesis of the crop composition database, which we call the CCDB, it was put together, the, the first uh, version of the database was put together in 2003. And the genesis of this came from the fact that the food products derived from genetically engineered plants, they're required to go through a mandatory pre-market safety assessment. The international paradigm for GE food safety assessment comes from the Codex Alimentarius. And the assessment is a comparative assessment, which means that you 
you compare the food derived from the genetically engineered plant with its conventional counterparts, the isogenic or near isogenic parental line. And this is a requirement in regulatory agencies throughout the world. One of the challenges when genetically engineered plants were, were first put out to the market and the safety assessments were starting to evolve was there wasn't a comprehensive resource of verifiable data about the natural variability of the compositional components of plant species. And so what you see here is the, the evolution of the CCDB. Not surprisingly, um, in 2003, when the first version was launched, the data that was limited to two, two crops, corn and soybean, simply because those were the two crops that were um, most popular, if you will, in terms of the, gen the genetically engineered um, crop species that were entering into the marketplace. The database um, has, has grown over time, both to include um, more data for existing crops, to improve, include new crops, and also there's been a lot of effort to actually improve the functionality of the database itself. So the ELC Research Foundation's role in this is to act as a curator of the data, or the repository for the data, but the data is provided by other organizations. There are strict um, criteria for actually accepting data into the crop composition database. And this is really important, particularly from a traceability standpoint. So the samples that are used for the analytical work come from known field trials. And by known, we mean knowing the, the plot location, the region, and the country. Um, some information related to cultivation is included as well, or is, is uh, incorporated as well, particularly seeding and harvesting date. And I'm going to come back to that in a little while. And then also the variety name of uh, the, the crop variety from which the samples have been taken. In terms of sample collection, um, the samples are composites um, from representative plants from one plot. Um, adequate storage is a requirement to ensure that there's no nutrient degradation prior to the analytical work. And again, emphasizing the importance of traceability, there has to be known records. There's a record keeping requirement to ensure chain of custody of the samples from the point of harvest through to analysis. The sample analysis of those composite samples must take place within 12 months of harvest. And the analyses um, have to be undertaken by an accredited, a certified, or an experienced laboratory using validated methods and a certified and historically verified standards. And then again, this, this is the benchmark for, for quality for, for the data. Continuing on in the database, one data point is from the analysis of that single composite sample. The data provider has to retain records and data after submission to the database. And the, the um, advisory group to the database, the Crop Composition Database Working Group, requires that any outlier tests be performed on any data before publication, and that potential outliers have to be um, evaluated and verified before being included in the database. Um, the data have to be archived and available for audit by the OC Research Foundation if there are queries about um, any of the data included in the resource. The OC Research Foundation also acts as a, a focal point for organizations that might want to consider providing data to the database in terms of evaluating whether or not the data that they'd like to have included will actually meet the existing criteria. And then also, if they do meet the criteria, to do the appropriate training to allow the data provider to actually upload those data in the back end of the resource. So how, how do you actually determine, or how, how has the, the CCDB working group determined what should be analyzed um, in, in regards to the crop-specific samples? And the baseline of the, the resource of information from this, this is from the OECD working group on the safety of novel foods and feeds. And that working group publishes a series of consensus documents. And those consensus documents uh, compile information and data on nutrients, anti-nutrients, toxicants of organisms. But to this point in time, the focus has largely been on plants. So these are crop-specific um, consensus documents that address composition. So each document um, has a section that explains the plant material samples that should be sampled. So for example, you don't need to sample the roots because we're not eating the roots of the soybean plant. So what are the, the plant parts that should be sampled and should be subsequently analyzed? 
So those are the best, those are the baseline resource documents for determining what should actually be analyzed for inclusion um, into the CCDB. And currently the CCDB includes 195 compositional components, and of course that's an aggregate, aggregate number across all of the crops that are included. So to date, we have almost a, a million data points in the crop composition database, and those represent data that have come from managed field trials um, in over 19 countries, and these data have been accumulated over 20 plus years. You can see um, here on the left-hand side, uh, the distribution of the entries in the database um, by crop with an overwhelming amount of information about field corn and soybean, again, because those have been the two crops that have been longest represented in the database. But what we're trying to do um, is, is improve and increase the number of crops that we would like to have. And again, I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. In terms of the countries where field trials have been run, you can see that information over here. So one of the limitations, we're often asked in the CCDB, why don't you have crop X? Why don't you have crop Y? And we would love to have more data. And we've had some really you know, vigorous discussions and there were differences of, of opinion or perspective on um, opening up the database. And one of the ways to be able to do that is to change the criteria for data entry. Right now, the, the criteria, the threshold is quite high. And so that's why it is a robust data set, purposely so, because they're used for safety assessments. So regulatory decisions are being predicated in part on the data that's included in the database. But you can also tell from you know, the crop species that are included here is that we have a lot, a lot of representation with commodity crops. What we would really like to be able to do is include more crop species, particularly crops that are important for food security purposes. Most of the plant breeding around those crop species is undertaken by the public sector. So this is just an example of the most recent data that's been uploaded into the CCDB. And this is just some background. So this is data that's been submitted to the Crop Composition Database by the International Rice Research Institute, which is based on the Spanish of the Philippines. And so the samples um, that uh, were analyzed came are samples of paddy rice and straw. They were collected from three blocks of rice grown at four locations in the Philippines over two growing seasons. In addition to the straw and grain, um, brand was also tested um, to specifically look at quality, meet quality standards for protein. The analytes that Erie um, requested the CRO to test were pulled out of one of those consensus documents. This is the most recent update to rice that was published by the OECD in 2016. So they tested 100 samples and the cost is there $97,500. <coughs> and this was for the non-GLP analysis. This is really, this is a lot of money in the context of a public sector plant breeding program. And that's one of the challenges that we have with the CCDB. We want to include more data. We want to include more data for a broader variety of plant species. But how are we actually able, how are we going to be able to do that? So this is one of, one of the areas of discussion that we're having internally, but also externally with plant breeding partners to see you know, what are some of the creative solutions that we might be able to undertake to be able to broaden the scope of the data that's included in, um, in the database. So again, just very quickly to introduce you to the database, the, the location of the database here, the URL. Um, this is the landing page. And over here on the right uh, is the entire sort of first page, if you will, and I've just blown up a couple of sections. It's fairly straightforward. Um, the information to facilitate the user is often provided and what's provided over here, but there also is a much more detailed um, user guide as well. So you can select um, the crop that you want and you can select the tissue type that you would like to get information about as well. Um, this is a blow up from over here and, and it's uh, querying the database for the specific kinds, kinds of information that you want in terms of nutrients um, or anti-nutrients that are included. And then creating a customized search report, you put in the criteria for the search report, and then additional information. So you can customize the report out from the CCDB. 
This is just a, an image from a summarized data report, and then you can drill down and actually get more detailed information. And, and this includes the, the year of the field trial, it includes the state or the location where the field trial was conducted, not down to the plot level, um, but that information, the analysis method that was used um, to provide the, the analytical value, the value, and then the units on the right hand side. So what are the next steps for the CCDB? I already mentioned that we would really like to be able to open this up as a resource to introduce new crop species and, and to you know, continue to, to include updated data for ex the crops that we already have um, in, the, in the database. So we're looking for new crops, we're looking for new data providers, and we're also looking for new end users. The crop composition database has, I think, largely been known by a very, very small community, and that's the community that's been involved in regulatory sciences related to GE food safety assessment. Um, but as I find out from colleagues across the OC organization, these data um, have a greater value than the limited use for which the database was originally put together. And that's one of the reasons I'm speaking you, to you today is to try to increase awareness about the CCDB, to look for other opportunities, um, both to, to utilize the existing resource, but to enhance that as well through partnerships. Um, we'd like to be able to provide guidance or continue to provide guidance to new data providers. And I've already mentioned our desire to, <laughs> to build new collaborations. One of the, the discussions that we've been having are with, with crop modelers, and this is a particular group that we work with at the University of Florida for a completely different project. And we, we were talking one day and, and let them know about the crop composition database. And they were really interested in this because in their crop models, they don't have a lot of information about nutrition. And this is becoming more and more important as we integrate models, um, which is a completely different area that the Research Foundation is engaged in. And so to be able to do that, though, and to make the nutrition information that we have in the CCD be useful to them, we have to anchor each of those data points, not just in the information that's already included, but to drill down a little bit deeper, because they want to understand, you know, the time, the place, and what was the agro, what were the agroclimatic conditions um, that were in place when the, that plant material was harvested. So this, this is going to be an ongoing discussion, but I think it's a really exciting opportunity for us to build out the robustness um, of the database. In terms of the database itself, um, we want to continue to improve the user interface, and we'd particularly like to hear from any nutritionists who, who would uh, be generous with their time and take a look at the database to let us know whether or not there are different ways that the data should be expressed in terms of reports that would be much more applicable to the work that you do versus the traditional audience for the database. And of course, we want to continue to, to improve upload search and report functions. There's more information about the evolution of the crop composition database and a series of, of peer-reviewed publications. These are open access and available on the LC Research Foundation website. And just a few final thoughts. Um, as Allison already mentioned, and you are all more than well aware, food composition data are foundational for many important scientific health and policy interventions. But too often, food composition data resources are underappreciated and underfunded. And so what we're wondering, as I'm sure all of you have as well, what are the opportunities to leverage some of these existing efforts to utilize these data in the way that I just mentioned in terms of crop modeling across multiple platforms? And really key to being able to achieve this is to, to build novel multi-sectoral partnerships. And maybe this is an opportunity for um, pooling the limited resources that have been made available to, to actually approve information for food composition databases. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, the folks that have helped us with this um, case of wins. This was really uh, the, the brainchild and the hard work has been done by Brittany Lee and Karen Christensen of the Ilse Research Foundation. I also want to, to give a shout out to Colleen Chen from the Ilse Southeast Asia region, who had done some, some work that was really, really helpful um, to us as we started putting this out. StatSilk is the company that provided us with uh, the software StatPlan. 
Um, there were a number of food composition database managers and, and other experts who helped provide um, information and also critiqued um, the resource and continue to do so. And again, we would welcome input from any of you who would like to take a look at the resource and help us improve it or partner um, to further develop it. The crop composition database, um, key staff there, Lori Bennett and Andrew Roberts. And the crop composition database working group um, includes uh, data scientists from each of the organizations that are represented here. And again, that's a group that we would be very willing to expand the partnership partnership with. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention.